Game of Thrones Season 8 Episode 3 is The Long Night. The army of the dead attacks Winterfell. The living are Daenerys and Jon with the dragons, the Dothraki and Unsullied, armies of the North, Vale and Wildlings, and almost every other living character. Bran is with Theon in the Godswood, cause the plan is to lure the Night King and kill him to end the war. So the whole gang's here, fighting to save the world. And they use some questionable battle tactics. Their trebuchets are in front of their defences, so they only get to fire once before they're overwhelmed and useless. The infantry are in front of the trenches, so the trenches don't protect them, in fact they get in the way of the retreat. You'd think everyone just should have stayed in Winterfell, defending the castle, cause that's what castles are for. There are lots of weird tactics this episode, made for the sake of heightening the drama. Melisandre arrives, she left for Volantis last season, and some fans hoped that she'd return with an army, or other red priests. Melisandre doesn't bring allies, but she does bring fire magic, setting alight the Dothraki weapons. It sure is lucky she came, because those Dothraki Arax aren't Valyrian steel or dragonglass, so they would have been pretty useless against the dead if Mel hadn't shown up. Melisandre is confronted by Davos, he once promised to execute Mel because she burned his friend Shireen. She says there's no need to kill her because she'll die tonight. There's this great shot of Melisandre's shadow in the light. Melisandre believes in just good and evil, black and white, with nothing in between. But ironically, Melisandre is one of the most morally grey characters in the series. She does great things and terrible things, and everything in between. The Dothraki charge, lights in the darkness like stars, that blink out one by one as the Dothraki die. It's a terrifying apocalyptic image that also evokes Dothraki religion. The Dothraki believe that when they die, their spirit becomes a star, riding a fiery horse across the night sky. The more fiercely a man burns in life, the brighter his star shines. So it's all the more horrifying that those fiery Dothraki are extinguished in pitch darkness. The showrunners say this is the end of the Dothraki, which is a pretty bleak end to their journey. Daenerys spent whole seasons winning the trust of the Dothraki. She learned to be a Khaleesi, and led her Khalasar through the Red Waste. In season 6 she returned to the Dothraki and gathered a massive army, declaring them all her personal blood riders, to cross the seas and conquer as no other Dothraki had to be hers now and always. But ten minutes into this battle, they're all dead. We never got to see the Dothraki perspective on foreign Westeros, or how the Dothraki habit of burning and raiding would fit in Danny's regime. There weren't even any named Dothraki this season, unless you count Kono, and no one counts Kono. So this is a sad, sudden end to the people who shaped so much of Daenerys' story. The plan is to keep the dragons out of combat until the Night King comes, but when Danny sees the Dothraki die, she abandons the plan and she and Jon burn some zombies, as they should have from the start. Jon tries to attack the White Walkers, who lead the dead, but the Walkers conjure a storm that blows him back, similar to the storm at Hardhome. The dead crash into the living like an unstoppable force of nature. Jamie, Brienne, Pod, Tormund, Beric, Hound, Gendry, Sam, and Ed are all on the front lines, and somehow they all survive this, except for Ed, which is just his luck. RIP to the 999th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. The fighters realise that this castle thing was a good idea after all, so they retreat into Winterfell, while the Unsullied hold back the dead. The Unsullied are uniquely qualified for this sort of thing. In Game of Thrones history, a group of 3,000 Unsullied famously held off an army of Dothraki at Kohor. 20,000 Dothraki broke on the Unsullied like waves on a rocky shore. So the Unsullied are really good at this, but they can only last so long against the dead. So Grey Worm closes the trench behind his men, sacrificing them. So very early in this battle, most of Daenerys' army is destroyed. Her Dothraki and Unsullied are mostly gone. So afterwards, Daenerys will need the support of the North more than ever. The living try to light the trench with fiery torches. It's like a reverse of Helm's Deep from Lord of the Rings. The torches fail, so Melisandre steps up. 
Mel had a crisis of faith after Stannis died in season 5. She regained some confidence when she resurrected Jon, and now she calls on her god to give her fire, and the trenches light. So Melisandre is filled with faith. She believes that her god has a plan. In the Godswood, Bran uses his warging powers to control some ravens, and he flies them up to the Night King on his zombie dragon. It's unclear if Bran is trying to get the Night King's attention, or if he's just having a look-see, or what, but Bran spends the rest of the battle in warg mode, doing nothing that we can see. Which seems like a waste of his powers. Bran spent six seasons learning magic to fight the White Walkers, and now he's not using his powers? He doesn't warg a dragon, or have some important vision, or tell anyone anything useful? It seems as though Bran knows the future, he knows how this battle will end, so he's just sitting and watching while destiny runs its course. Which is pretty underwhelming, like that the culmination of Bran's training is him sitting being bait, nothing more than a MacGuffin on wheels. Did Jojen and Hodor and Bran's personality die for this? The dead are held back by the fiery trench, but the Night King orders them to form a bridge of corpses. Part of why the Whites are scary is that they have human bodies, but no humanity. They're just mindless machines with no self-preservation and no mercy. The dead assault the walls, and the heroes hack and slash. A bunch of times we see characters facing certain death covered in Whites, but then someone saves them with one sword stroke, or the camera just cuts away, and it's scary the first few times, but soon it's clear that none of the main characters are in real danger. Lyanna Mormont, the young lady of Bear Isle, dies, killing a white giant. Lyanna had always talked big talk, now she follows through with action, giving her life to defend the North. There are hints in the books that Tormund might be Lyanna's father, go watch that video. So it's cool that last episode Tormund claimed to have killed a giant, now his possible daughter Lyanna has also killed a giant, it must run in the family. The Hound freaks out. He's afraid of fire, since his brother the Mountain burned his face. In Season 2, the Hound ran from the Battle of Blackwater because of this fear. But when the Hound sees Arya in trouble, he overcomes his fear and rushes to help her. So again, Arya inspires the Hound to be a braver, better man. Arya does some sick ninja moves, using all her training with the Faceless Men. They taught her how to fight with staffs and to fight in the dark. But she takes a blow to the head and retreats to the Winterfell Library for a stealth section, like the kitchen scene in Jurassic Park. She silently kills a white and gently lowers it to the ground. This is an intimate dance with death. Aya's arc is all about the deaths of her friends, the deaths of her enemies. Now she gets dangerously close to her own death. When she's overwhelmed, the Hound and Beric save her. Beric gives up his last life, sacrificing himself in a Jesus tea pose. Beric believed that the Lord of Light had a special plan for him, and that's why he was resurrected six times. Turns out his special destiny was to save Arya. You'd think that God could have just cut out the middleman and resurrected Arya if needed, but since when were gods efficient? Arya sees Melisandre. They met before in Season 3. Melisandre had told Arya that she would shut many eyes forever, including blue eyes. She also reminds Arya of something Sirio said. What do we say to the god of death, not today? So Mel is hinting that Arya's destiny is to kill the Night King, the blue-eyed embodiment of death. Of course, these scenes were shot before the showrunners decided to have Arya kill the Night King, so they're sort of retconned into something that sounds relevant. Melisandre changes the wording of the eyes quote to emphasise the blue eyes. The series spent seven seasons setting up Jon and Daenerys as the forces to beat the White Walkers. But now at the last minute, they shoehorn Arya in as though she was foreshadowed from the start. In the skies, the dragons dance. There hasn't been a dragon fight in Westeros for over a hundred years, and there's never been a fight with a zombie dragon. Daenerys' dragon wounds the zombie dragon Viserion, ripping off half his face. But Jon's dragon Rhaegal is also hurt and crashes with Jon to the ground. Daenerys' dragon burns the Night King, but he's unhurt and smirks like an anime villain. Jon chases the Night King on foot, so the Night King raises all the dead as zombies. Ed, Lyanna, and Kono all rise to fight their former allies. 
John is completely surrounded by zombies, but when the camera cuts back, he's fine. John has survived so many unsurvivable situations lately that it's getting hard to care when he's in danger. Daenerys lands her dragon and it's swarmed by zombies, like ants over a lizard. Daenerys falls off Drogon, she should really strap herself onto a saddle, like the old Targaryens did. Jorah's Khaleesi sense tingles and he rushes to help her. Jorah ultimately dies protecting Daenerys, which is about the best death he could have hoped for. He's always been defined by his loyalty to his Khaleesi, so he dies as he lived. Meanwhile, Tyrion, Sansa, Missandei, Varys, and Gilly hide in the crypts. Tyrion wants to help the battle somehow, but Sansa says they can't do anything, so they don't. Tyrion jokes that he and Sansa should have stayed married, but Sansa says it wouldn't work because of Tyrion's divided loyalties. He's more loyal to Daenerys than to the Starks. The show seems to be setting up conflict between Daenerys' squad and Jon's, and Tyrion is at its centre. When the Night King raises the dead, the dead Starks in the crypts also rise. Who would have thought that a room full of corpses would be dangerous with an icy necromancer on the loose? Sansa and Tyrion share a moment of tenderness, holding dragonglass daggers. Some viewers saw this like they were about to kill themselves, but a behind the scenes feature suggests that they're actually about to fight the zombies in some cut footage. The living are overwhelmed by the dead, and Jon tries to get to Bran. He sees Sam almost killed by whites, but doesn't help him, which in bird culture is considered a dick move. John ends up pinned by the wounded zombie dragon. Fire streams from its neck, where it was bit by Drogon. The walkers reach the godswood, and Theon is the last ironborn standing. Bran tells Theon that he's a good man, and that Winterfell is his home. All Theon ever wanted was a home, and a family that accepted him. That tension is what led him to betray the Starks and take Winterfell from Bran. But now, Bran forgives him. Theon finally gets his redemption and is killed by the Night King. In Book 5, Theon stands in this god's wood and prays for a sword. Let me die as Theon, not as Reek. And now he gets his wish. The Night King approaches Bran in ultra slow motion. He's waited 8,000 years for this, so like any supervillain, he takes his sweet time. He and Bran represent powerful magical forces. Bran, the three eyed raven, holds the world's memory and history, whatever that means. And the Night King is an ancient weapon who turned on his creators, the children of the forest. Just as the Night King is about to kill Bran, Arya leaps from nowhere and attacks. The Night King catches Arya, but she drops her dagger into her off hand and stabs the Night King, in the same place where the dragonglass that created him was also stabbed. Arya's Valyrian knife was originally used in an attempt on Bran's life. Now Arya uses the knife to save Bran's life. And the knife has a much older history. Sam once found a book connecting the knife to the ancient Targaryens who took Westeros 300 years ago. The showrunners hinted that the hilt of this blade is made from the same chunk of dragonglass that created the Night King, and so he was unmade by the same dragonglass that created him. The Night King is destroyed, and all his walkers and whites fall, just like in The Phantom Menace. Arya ends the Great War, and Melisandre walks out into the dawn. She dedicated her life to winning this war. She is hundreds of years old, essentially a slave to her god. Now, with her purpose finally fulfilled, Melisandre lets herself rest. She reverts to her true ancient form and dies in the snow. So, this episode brings a neat end to the arcs of Melisandre, Theon, and Jorah. But what does it mean for the main characters, and the White Walkers, and the Game of Thrones itself? In recent seasons, there's a lot of foreshadowing leading up to Arya killing the Night King in the Godswood. Bran gave Arya her Valyrian knife in the Godswood last season, and you can tell he had a special purpose in mind. Then Arya sneaks up on Jon in the Godswood, just as she sneaks up on the Night King. And Arya uses the same hand-switching trick with the knife on Brienne that she uses on the Night King. Arya trained for seasons to be a stealthy, deadly assassin. Her story is about death, and the Night King is the embodiment of death. Maybe now that she's killed him, Arya can let go of her vengeance quest, and start to reconnect with her humanity. So, from the perspective of Arya's story, her killing the Night King makes a lot of sense. 
But what does it mean for John and Daenerys? It's clear from the start that John and Daenerys are central to the magic and prophecy in this story, the Song of Ice and Fire. Daenerys was miraculously reborn, unburnt with dragons beneath a bleeding star. Jon Snow was resurrected like Christ, he's been fighting the dead since season one, and he's faced off the Night King repeatedly. Jon and Danny both come from the ancient magic Targaryen bloodline, and there's a prophecy hinting that they will save the world from the White Walkers with some magic sacrifice. The show doesn't mention the prophecy stuff as much as the books do, but it's still heavily hinted that defeating the Walkers is Jon and Danny's destiny. So it's pretty crazy that Jon and Danny not only don't kill the Night King, but they're barely involved in the end. Like, while Arya saves the world, Danny is crying over Sir Friendzone, and Jon is yelling at a dragon. It's not clear if Jon and Danny even helped beat the Walkers at all. Like, yeah, they gathered the armies and helped fight the dead, but that was always a losing battle, just a ploy to lure the Night King. If Jon and Danny weren't there at all, the Night King still would have come for Bran, and Arya still could have killed him, right? Jon and Danny represent the Song of Ice and Fire, and yet they played only minor roles in its climax. The showrunners said they had Arya kill the Night King because it was unexpected. And Game of Thrones has always had surprising twists, like when the main character, Ned Stark, died in season one, and the deaths of Catelyn and Rob at the Red Wedding. But those twists had meaning, they showed how honour and love can get you killed in a world of treacherous politics. What's the meaning of Arya jumping from nowhere to kill the Night King? That it's cool to be a ninja? That Arya's dehumanising, murderous, hate fueled quest was good? And where does that leave Jon and Daenerys? If their destiny isn't about beating the White Walkers, what is it about? Taking the Iron Throne? Because the whole point of the Walkers is to show that the throne is irrelevant. Human greed and pride will only lead to our self-destruction. The Walkers are an apocalyptic threat that forces humanity to abandon their petty power struggles and unite. The North, the Wildlings and Daenerys come together to face a true enemy. But suddenly that's all over in episode 3, so will Jon and Danny now fight another war for the throne against Cersei? Why include the White Walkers in the story if they're just a stepping stone to another petty war? Was the ancient ice demon apocalypse just a warm up for the real war against a drunk queen and her pal, the horny pirate? Thrones author George Martin says his series will end like the Lord of the Rings books, with the scouring of the Shire. In the final chapters of Rings, after the good guys beat Sauron, the hobbits return to the Shire and have to deal with Saruman. It's a bittersweet epilogue that shows that the world is saved, but it's also changed, and its heroes have too. Maybe Thrones will do something similar. The big bad White Walkers are defeated, but taking Cersei off the throne will be a time to reflect on how the last eight seasons have scarred Westeros and its people. But there are three long episodes left, and if they're filled with more big battles and power struggles, that would undercut the whole point of the Walkers as a metaphor for how terrible and pointless war is. We also learned nothing new about the White Walkers, no great revelations of their motivations or origins, nothing about these spirals or the babies or the deeper mysteries hinted in the books, and maybe that's fine, the White Walkers aren't characters, they're a device. Like zombies in other stories, their purpose is to push the human characters to extremes, to show what they're really made of and make them do extraordinary things. But in this episode, the main characters did nothing new. Jon and Daenerys were brave, Arya was badass, Tyrion drank wine, Bran was confusing. We did get neat conclusions for Theon and Jorah and Beric and Mel, but these are secondary characters. You'd think the final confrontation with the ultimate bad guys should have brought out something climactic from the main characters. You'd also think that at least one main character would have died. But in the end, the White Walkers just didn't impact the story that much. Walder Frey killed more important characters than the Night King did. All the Walkers really did was bring Jon and Daenerys together. And if Jon and Danny's alliance just leads to more war, it's hard to see the point. And sure, maybe there'll be a twist. Maybe the Night King will respawn at the Spiral Tree for round two, and some climax with Jon and Danny might happen after all. Maybe Bran was up to something with his magic. 
We still don't know what he was doing all battle, or what his arc is meant to mean. We'll just have to wait and see. Game of Thrones ends in a few weeks. The Game of Thrones books go deep into prophecy, with intricate hints and symbolism. But we're also warned against prophecy. One of the coolest characters in the books who doesn't appear in the show is Marwyn the Mage, a sort of rogue professor, a paranoid maverick maester. He talks about the prophecy of Azora High that hints that Jon or Daenerys will beat the White Walkers, and he says he doesn't trust it. He compares prophecy to a treacherous woman who gives pleasure until her teeth snap shut. That is the nature of prophecy. Prophecy will bite your prick off every time. You can hear all about Marwyn and Azora High for free today by signing up for a trial with Audible. Members get a book each month, and if you cancel, you keep the books. You can read in the car or the gym, or while you chill out and wait for your sister to save the world. Sign up at audible.com slash ASX. Thanks for watching. We're holding live streams right after each episode of Thrones, and Patreon supporters can watch past live streams. Thanks to patrons Peter Meehan, Emily McNally, Sandra Lang, Marion, Patrick Long, Robert Gain, and Cool0210. Cheers.